Hey there, and welcome to the Everyday Millionaire Mindset Matters podcast. Stephanie. Hey, hon. So we've got a big topic that we're taking on today, and it's life balance, life work balance. What do you think? Well, yeah, I think you know what I think about that word balance. <laughs> I think it's a bit of a myth. It's a myth. I'm going to call this topic, and I'm going to actually title my blog post, Life balance is bullshit. That's what I think. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> what do you really hey. feel? Yeah, that's how I really feel. So when we look at what's happening, we often over the years have fallen into the trap of believing that there's this life balance or life work balance. Many fall into the trap of thinking if I just didn't work as much or I don't have balance because I'm always working or I don't have balance because I'm spending too much time over here, over there. And there's lots of things. It could be managing relationships. It could be uh, putting out financial fires. It feels like there's never a balance. And what I'm saying in all of this, and this is what I want to talk about today, is life balance is bullshit. And that's really the message that I want to unpack today and saying, okay, well, how did we even get to that conclusion? And then some tools to even think about it in a slightly different way, because this really is a mental game. Uh, what's your thoughts? Anything you want to add on that before I carry on? Well, before we break it down and kind of go into the to the technical side of it, I think it's important to realize that by trying to force balance or force having the exact same time, uh, let's say recreationally as you do in your business or and your family gets the exact exact amount of time as your business does, etc. It can cause more stress than anything. And I think it's really important that we point that out that we can't give the exact amount of time. It's impossible. And when we try to strive for it, it can lead to everything from anger to stress to depression. And I think it's really important that we um, we decide to unpack this. Okay, let's break down the life balance is bullshit story and why I came to that and why we come to that conclusion. And I know many, and if, it's interesting that the more successful people are, and I say successful, the more they've built businesses or the more they've advanced in their career or any combination of those things, if you're having a conversation and say, well, how's your life work balance or how's your life balance? They look at you like there's no such thing. They understand, but many don't. Now, do you think there's a reason that is? Or when you talk to your athlete clients or your business clients, is is it still a thing? I, I mean, from my experience, it is. What is it for you? Well, I think it's a thing because it's a it's an illusion that people want to come in so they'll they'll have some results or some success in all areas of life at the same time. I always say that you can have it all. You just can't have it all at the same time. Mm. And that comes across sometimes as negative or as sacrifice. But with a professional athlete or the athletes that I work with, there's no sacrifice. They're making choices every day. And from people on the outside looking and saying, well, you're giving up so much to go skating or to become an Olympian or to become an NHL hockey player or to build a business. No, you're not. You're actually gaining so much more. It may look to other people, especially if you're taking time away from them and they they want to spend more time with you. That's the, that's a different issue. That's a, a completely different conversation. When you're focused on being successful or being the best, and we talk about really doing our best to live, to live our best lives, it doesn't take balance. It doesn't take sacrifice. It takes choices and then commitment and focus on the things that you say you love. And in our, for me, in my life is that if I'd I'm striving for balance, I'm actually compromising. I don't want to live in containers that this much time to goes to this and this much time goes to that. And I can't cross over and I can't have multiple conversations with multiple people at the same time, because mm -hmm. that's not the container I'm working in. And that to me is more stressful than anything else. Well, I think there's a couple of things around this all, right? Which is first, we often hear the phrase, I don't have life work balance. Now we know what that means, but I think people literally compartmentalize and they work wrong or they think they're working too hard got it but there really isn't life work there's just life and within life there is work now over the years and based on the work that we did many many years ago 20 years plus ago really opened up the conversation around the seven areas of life and that was based on work we did with dr john d martini and uh, we've mentioned him many times. He was very impactful on our own journey of professional and personal development, how we saw the world, universal law, all of those things. And when we look at the seven areas of life, as we break them down, we go, okay, so there's life. And in life, there's a physical, mental, 
emotional, spiritual, vocational, financial, and what we'll call relational kind of buckets, if you will, within life. So life isn't any one thing, it's a number of things. And when we break it into those seven components, it's easier to grasp. It's easier to kind of start to think backwards from, well, what is my life all about? And right now, you may be focused on what's happening vocationally or what's happening familial like, or, or relational with your kids or your family. It could be that. It could be a career development. And so when you start to put them in containers, you realize that you could be having a really shitty day. And then when you step back from it, you go, well, it's not my whole day. It's not my whole life is crappy. It's, I'm having a trouble. I'm having some challenges in my career or maybe financially you felt like you take a hit. So you break it down. And it's all to say this, when we break it down that way, we're less apt to say, okay, where's the balance and all that? Because there really isn't. There's just times where one bucket is being filled more than the other. That would be one way to look at it. What's your thoughts? Well, I agree completely. And I, I'm so blessed that we did that, found that Dr. G, uh, Demartini work many years ago, that we were able to start to have conversations within our marriage because people would look at us sometimes and say, all you guys do is work. You work, 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 work. And I'm like, is that really true? I had so much fun with my friends. We had family, we gatherings every Sunday. We, you know, it wasn't like it was work, 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 work. But on the outside, it looked like that. But that was what my, for me, I speak for myself, that was my priority. That's what I loved to do. And when you can focus on what you love to do, the other stuff starts to fall into place in a much healthier way. Mm -hmm. So I love to skate. I love to talk. I love to help people. And I started to build a career on it. So my friends, I started to see that they would, you know, they'd buy into the conversation or maybe they just want to talk about other things. And some people would come and, and go out of our lives. So it really is what you're focused on, what you love to do. Look at what you're surrounding yourself with, where you live and start to identify is that truly what you love and if it isn't that could be the the first um what would be what would i call it kind of a trigger that you think that you're out of balance so to speak well i think there's a few things behind it you know not least of which is many are impacted by social media and when i say many i have fallen into that trap over the years and and i'm pretty good at it now i don't have a lot of attachment around it but let's put it this way we all look at social media i shouldn't say we all most or many look at social media, they see that moment in time, that perfect picture that was of a literally a moment in time that gets posted. And then if you're if you're comparing yourself to that moment in time where somebody's walking down the beach or having a good time or at a party or whatever the case may be, you may in fact look at your life and go, oh, I don't ever have moments like that, which is not true. But I don't ever have moments like that. I must not be living my best life. I may be or must be out of balance. And so to your point earlier, you used the word illusion. So we have this illusion we live that we think we're not enough. We're not having the best life. We're out of balance. We should be working less, making way more money, hanging out at the beach or hanging out with friends on the boat, whatever the case may be. And it is a bit of an illusion. And we're setting ourselves up for an immense amount of frustration because there is just a part of it that that just may not be what it is for you yet and or you can improve on it. So do you want to expand on that a little bit? I do. We did a, a podcast a while back called Ask Us Anything. And there was two questions on there it just popped into my mind. Two questions relatively the same. And they asked us, how do you guys separate work and your home life, your partners in business, your partners in life, etc. And it, because it came out twice, I thought I found it quite interesting and I feel our answers were quite direct around, we don't really see it that way. Mm -hmm. We have our life and within our life, we have shared businesses. If I need some extra TLC from you, or I need something that maybe looks more like a hobby or looks like we're gonna hang out and do no, you know, not talk business that day, then I have to express that as, as a person, as a woman, as your wife. You know, I'm not expecting you to say, okay, we're going to have 50, 50, 50% 50 of our conversation at dinner is going to be around business. And 50% is going to be about what? I don't know, rainbows and unicorns and whatever. I don't know. Or hobbies and which we don't share a lot of hobbies together because what we do share is a lot of our in interest in family and in relationships and in coaching and helping people. So trying to expand on that, not so many words, is that the question was about how do you balance your life and your relationship and your business? And the, tr and the fact is, I don't think we do. I just think we live in the moment, 
we try to prioritize. We have, I know what my hierarchy of values is right now and that I'm working towards. So then it's my responsibility as a person to express that, not to put that on you or anybody else or to look at anybody else's life and say, gosh, they're really out of balance because all they do is focus on their kids. You know, that's to me, that's a judgment. So let's break it down some, you know, a little bit further. So when we look at the seven areas of life, just to give some context to this and a little bit more meaning, a little more depth, when we look at the seven areas of life, first off, we just have life. Within that life, we've broken it down into these seven areas. What that allows us to do is step back from it. And although there is never a balance, I know that I go through life where I'm going, you know, something I'm just putting so many hours in right now because I've got this project. I want to achieve whatever result I'm trying to achieve. And I need a break. The good news is because we've really stepped into a world where we love what we do most of the time when it comes to our careers and our businesses, it's not to say, by the way, we're not faced with epic challenges because we are, but the reality of it is, is if I'm working hard, I've got a project, I've got things I want to do uh, that I want to get done and I'm feeling tired, I just say, okay, it's time to take a break. It's time to peel back. And then I can look at it and go, you know something, I've been so busy. I haven't been physical enough. I haven't got my workout in or a workout in. And now I have to get physical. So what do I do? I go out. It's a perfect time of year. I go do yard work. I work up a sweat. I do whatever I need to do to get physical because to me that brings me back into some form of equilibrium mentally. It also supports me emotionally and even spiritually because I'm out doing something in my Focus is not just on the business aspect of it. That's where some great ideas get to to show up. So a little long-winded, I'm going to add one more layer to it, and that is this. We go through periods of time where one bucket gets really drained. You know, for me, and I'll just speak for myself, although I know there's many that could say this, over the past three years of lockdowns and hanging around and not being able to do and getting out of, I guess, out of sync with what life once was, you know, I got a little less fit. I put on weight and I've now looked at it and said, no, hold it. That bucket's really empty. I'm going to start working on that physical side of things. So I've gotten more active. I've been watching what I eat. I back into some rhythm, if you will, and have lost some weight again, started to feel good again. Clothes are fitting better again. And for me, that is Some would look at that and go, well, you're getting back in balance. And I'm going, okay, maybe. I don't like to use the word balance. I'm just really doing what I need to do to look after me in my life overall. And one bucket was getting a little empty, so I'm putting some focus on it. That's kind of the context I have for it. You want to probably expand on that. I love that. Uh, Thank you for that. It's really important for me to hear, too, because I know for me, the same thing happened. My physical bucket or my pillar of of taking care of my body sort of went down the list of the hierarchy. And that was really noticeable for me recently because I'm trying to get myself into a state where I put I put myself back on my list. Self-care is so important to me and it was so important to my well-being. And I think it was important for the well-being of our relationship and our businesses and our family. And when I stopped taking care of myself in that way, whether it's physically, emotionally, spiritually, it shows up in other areas. It shows up in blocks, I call it, or in uh, in things that get in the way of the flow of, of our abundance or success and prosperity mindset. So getting back to that and understanding that each one of those buckets or each one of those values or priorities has equal amount of weight and but they change in order of importance. And what was important to me the last little while was vocation, was keeping my businesses afloat, keeping our businesses afloat. Mm-hmm. And that didn't mean that I gave up the physical. Thank goodness we, we work and live in, a, in the country so we can be outside and walk, etc. But ultimately, self-care is to me the foundation of what people may consider striving for balance. I think it's self-care in the area of the physical body, because if we don't take care of our bodies, as my little cousin used to say, where are we going to live? Where are we going to live? And I just thought that was (laughs) very cute. So there's a couple things around this that you just shone a light on, which is certain aspects of these seven areas support each other. So for me, I can connect my physicality with both my mental and let's say emotional side of things. Because when I get physical, I have that kind of just the way my body and my brain works. It's a nice detachment from thinking in a kind of 
focused way and or in a minutiae kind of way or problem solving kind of way. I can go out and do something physical, give myself a break. The other side of that is for some might be feeling a lot of stress. And so they look at it and they go, you know, saying I just need to start taking the time to meditate, give my brain a bit of a uh, break, if you will, a bit of a vacation and start getting into the practice of meditation. None of these things on their own will create this kind of, I don't know, the, this place called uh, ideal balance. I just, you know, we just look at it and say, what bucket do we need to fill right now? Because when one bucket gets too low, it affects the other buckets, if you will. So I think there's just a way to look at it where we can continue to break it down. So when we look at the physical, we know that going for walks, uh, working out, uh, doing something physical that gets your heart rate up, all good. We know that that is proven and it works. We look at the, you know, how meditation and journaling, uh, getting that brain in a different space, uh, that works. When we look at doing and practicing stoic methods, for example, understanding what we control, what we can't control. And ultimately, we get to the point where we realize that the only thing we can control is our reaction to the things that are happening. So, and I'll end on this, and then I want to pass you the puck, and that is, Things don't cause us stress and anxiety. The way we view those things cause the stress and the anxiety. And when we break our life down into these buckets and we look at it and we go, what is this thing that I'm allowing to overtake my brain? And certainly recently, I've had a lot of that going on in my own head. It takes a lot of discipline and practice to pull back and go, don't buy into that. It's not the thing, it's how I view the thing. And my job is to use the tools to actually break that down differently so it doesn't create the stress and the anxiety. Well said. I, for me, what's really been up, like I said, has been vocation and finances. But what I don't want to step over is that I don't get out of bed without meditating. I will, I will get up, maybe go, go to the bathroom, come back to bed and actually do a meditation, whether it's a 20 minute TM meditation or it's a meditation where I'm just going through my day, going through letting my body process things. And how I process is sometimes just through meditating and having that time in the morning and giving myself that time before I have a coffee or dive into emails, etc., is really helpful and it's helpful for me physically as well. I can stretch, I do my stretches in the morning, I look out on our beautiful property and I do my stretches and I do my meditation. So that to me is physical, but it's also emotional and spiritual. So I'm getting myself organized in the morning. And then the other things I've learned to do, and you tease me about it all the time, is I schedule some social media breaks where I, I, create, I watch a crazy YouTube video or I watch some conspiracy theory thing or I listen to some music that I've really been drawn to. So I schedule that and it's usually in 10 or 15 minute chunks. So that kind of gives me a little bit of a mental break. I'm not a napper, I wish I was, but I know that for some people, they call it a neural alignment process. So your brain gets a break when you nap. I'm not a great napper, but what I can do is just turn my brain off, watch a little social media. Uh, when I do laundry, for example, I find that very meditative. So I find those ways of connecting in my day-to-day -day tasks. I mean, I still have to unload the dishwasher. I still want to do the laundry and fold it. But then I turn something on and I watch it that's either very mindless or something really inspiring. So it just depends on how I'm feeling. So that's how I see it all interconnect as well. You're hilarious, by the way. So I am now, neuro alignment process. You can remember that, but you don't remember that that was my acronym because JG and I were sitting back one day saying, you need to nap. We need a nap. And it's, it's good and it's healthy. And that's where I came up with neuro alignment process. Love it. That's I just take credit for everything. It's fine. Well, no, but what's even more funny is I totally forgot about it until you just brought it up. I need to use that one a little more often. So let's go back to a, kind of a couple things that we talk a lot about and we cannot stress enough. And that is you are the center of your universe. And when you're living into a belief system or a story or something that says, you're out of balance, you're negating the challenge that everybody faces, which is being the center of your universe. It's up to you how you, in fact, do two things. Number one, create some kind of sense of satisfaction, joy, uh, the sense that you're not being overwhelmed and that you've got things going the right way, even if they don't necessarily look like they're going the right way. 
but you have to get into a sense of being okay. And that's the challenge that we face. So if you're operating on top of a story that says, well, I'm out of balance and there should be something this elusive balance that in mentally is going to continue to beat you up mentally, emotionally, likely even spiritually. So when you're the center of your universe, it's a classic example, you know, that the airline flight attendant tells you, you know, should there be an emergency and the oxygen masks fall, put your mask on first so you can look after those around you. Do not put anybody else's mask on for them. Let them look after themselves. You look after you, then you are then equipped to look after those around. And that's really the message that we often want to get to everybody and even remind ourselves of. We need to continue to look after ourselves because we've got a lot of responsibility, whether it be our businesses, our friends, our family, uh, careers, all of the things that we do in life. We have to look after ourselves to have the capacity and the energy to be the CEO of our life. So um, what's your thoughts on that? Like when you're talking about, let's go back to, because I really like the examples that you give with your clients, your athletes. I mean, gosh, they're working out every day. They're just focused on training, 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 winning, winning, winning. Like, what do you give them for guidance in terms of, are they looking for balance or what are you training them around? Well, technically, when it comes to skating, it's all about balance. You know, if you don't <laughs> access your, your center of balance and your, your body working around that, you're going to fall down a lot. Mm. So I kind of make fun and I, I make jokes and, and invite them to look at where they're, you know, striving for balance within the sport and within the sport. And this is what I do with hockey as well, is I frame it in the way that the sport, whether it's hockey or figure skating or even business, is a vehicle, a vehicle for, for you to get what you want in life. So if this is what you're doing right now to win a gold medal or to win a Stanley Cup or to close the deal, it's going to create the next thing or the next set of to do's for you to live your best life or to move yourself forward sport or the metal is not the end game the deal closing is not the end game it can become an addiction and then it becomes a real um out of balance kind of opportunity where people just get way to one side of their life and really neglect the other. So my job is to always try to bring it in with humor, try to bring in, point out where they're maybe want to spend a little bit more time in one area. Maybe yeah. I'll bring up a conversation about, let's just have a little bu budget conversation. And that's how I fold in the vocational and the financial buckets. And then we can stretch the mind away from what they're doing physically all the time. Cause that's the other thing. I've often heard them called selfish and I've been called selfish and selfish is a tough word, especially in the last three years or so where we're told we have to do everything we can for everybody else and that you're a peon and you don't matter. And if you don't do this, this and this, then you're going to kill grandma. And that's what athletes feel sometimes is that they're training all summer, for example, in the off season, then they go into team development or individual development and into the competition season, into the tournament season. And then all of a sudden at the end of the year, it all starts all over again. So learning and teaching them how to reset, for example, and that word has been so hijacked. And when you are resetting yourself physiologically, emotionally, spiritually, it's such an important thing grounded in what is next, but honoring where you've come from, resting, taking some time away, walking in nature, going to see friends and family that they haven't seen for a long time. Time. they can give it to themselves without guilt because we framed it that way through the entire training season okay so as we start to wind this down and i want to bring something up that i think everybody will relate to and that is when we often have conversations about values and hanging out with people of like mind and who share common values and being aware of what your values even are because I think, and I would say based on conversation and experience, is that you really feel out of balance when you feel like you're being forced to do shit you don't want to do. And I don't care what it is. And that could be hanging out with friends so or family that you really don't want to, doing uh, jobs that you don't want to do, being in a career that you really don't like, it's not fulfilling. And when you're doing things that you don't like to do when you're tolerating things that you don't want to tolerate, but you do, you ultimately are feeling like everything is out of balance. And I think for the most part, when we look at our life, our relationship, our relationships, so you and my relationship, 
a relationship with family and or chosen family with what we do in our businesses and how we go, there's not a lot of like, I hate this shit kind of, there's not really a part of that. We can have moments in time where we get bitchy and pissed off and tired of it, but we don't hate it. So we don't really feel like life's out of balance. I can sometimes, if I'm having to really work hard around the yard, we've got a large property here. And if I'm taking it on whatever project it is, I can feel like it's unfair that it rains so much or that it doesn't rain enough and or, you know, the grass grows too much or the trees grow too, whatever. Like, and that can really piss me off. It's funny how the psychology works and it can all feel out of balance, right? Oh my gosh, this is stupid. Why am I doing all this? But really, uh, if we just take a moment to consider who are we hanging out with that we don't really want to hang out with, that can throw things out of balance. What are we tolerating from others or circumstances that we're choosing to tolerate? We think we have no choice, but we do. That will throw you out of balance. What job or career we have we got that we hate, we don't like, yet we continue to choose it? That will throw life out of balance. So multiple examples. I wanted to give you a nice, I guess, easy pass to take this on and say, from your perspective, what's your thoughts? Well, I, it's not even my perspective, but I think there's something that I said earlier that I thought was really smart is that when we are focused on things that we love to do and we're maybe delegating the things we don't love to do, can you do that without guilt? Can you do that with respect? Can you honor the fact that you have somebody that you can trust to do the things that you don't love to do that you're not great at? We have friends that are brilliant at cleaning houses and skilled at cooking and things and yard work and uh, bookkeeping that I, I just don't have the skills or the interest in. But if I think I have to do that all myself, no wonder I would feel out of balance because A, I'm not great at it. I'm, I don't have the competency. I don't have the interest. I do it when I have to do it because I'm a grown up. And of course, I'm not going to delegate everything because it's my life. And that's the other thing I'm hearing you say too, Patrick, is that it's my life. This is your life. We are the driver of it. We're the CEO. We're in control. If we don't like an experience, we have to receive that feedback and do what we can to change it. But that's been numbed out and it's been dumbed down. And I really want to, I get, ex I get excited when I think about helping people reconnect to what they love to do. If you're not doing, and I'm not saying what you love to do all the time, 24 mm seven, -hmm. but what lights you up? Like in this moment, as hard as it is to get the tech going for these podcasts and my my ADD and my lack of organization, we always seem to pull it together because you have very grounded energy. And I saw you even this weekend just work so hard physically to get our home looked after. It inspired me to do the same and make sure that I'm looking after the details I need to look after. And then I'm getting help, asking for help where I need it. Because you know what? It's life is short. And, you know, sometimes things can be hard. And I always say to my clients, choose your hard. You know, life is hard um, or skating's hard, but winning's hard, but so is losing. So we get to choose what it is. And I would rather choose to do the things that I'm good at, delegate some of the things that I'm not great at. Or if I know I'm helping somebody make money or build a business by hiring them as well. That's something that we have really committed to doing in our life. So we want to support the people that are good at what they do so that I can do what I am good at and what I love to do. It doesn't mean I minimize the things that I'm not good at. And do I want to focus on it? Sure. But one of the lessons I've learned over time is to focus on your strengths. Most coaches say, you know, focus on your weaknesses. Your strengths will look after themselves. And that's, I don't believe that. I believe it's the opposite. And when you focus on your strength and start to identify what you're not maybe 100% loving to do or good at or competent in, then it opens up the space for you to do more of what you love to do, which could, in fact, make you more money. It could, in fact, bring you more resources or more success in certain areas. But it also opens the space up to get supported in a different way. So focus on your strengths and let your weaknesses show up so you can identify them and you're not minimizing them and, and maybe doing a mediocre job at those things where you could actually have someone in your life who's lit up by doing the things you don't love to do. That was a lot of words. Make sense? Yeah, it totally does. It just reminded me quickly of a story JG shared with, you know, a group that we were doing some work with coaching around. And, you know, we talk about time management, which we don't believe in time management. We believe in focus management. But to your point, he, the bane of every entrepreneur's existence, I believe, is trying to keep track of receipts. 
I don't like it. You don't like it. Drives us both crazy. We try it. And then inevitably there's 10 receipts that are missing or three receipts that are missing. We've tried to do all these systems, all the rest of it. JG was no different. And JG said, I hate freaking accounting and receipts. It was driving me nuts. I just chose to ignore it for the longest time. And he walked into his office one day and he was handing something off to his bookkeeper. And he goes, I just can't get this freaking receipt stuff figured out. I hate receipts. And she goes, oh my God, JG, I love receipts. And he said it was like, what? And she said it was such passion. I love receipts. I like getting them and organizing them and doing all these things. And he's just couldn't even wrap his brain around somebody who could love receipts. And it wasn't that she loves receipts. She loves the process. She loves the balancing. She loves the collecting and putting them all together so they all make sense. So guess what? She now looks after all his receipts and to the degree that she'll go, uh, give me the keys to your truck because I think there's probably some receipts laying on the floor there somewhere. And he's going, yeah, probably. So the point is, is that she loves receipts. He hates it. He didn't ever think that anybody could love receipts because he hates it. It makes no sense to him. Yet, sure enough, she loves receipts. And that was years ago. And they haven't had a problem per se since. I haven't fun run across that person that loves receipts yet. So I keep struggling with it. But, you know yet to be determined. Well, we all have our cross to bear, don't we, Patrick? We do. So listen, any grand words of wisdom? Uh, I'm going to part with this and I'll probably part with something else. And that is life balance is bullshit. I think that we need to recontextualize it so that we're really kind of clear that we have control over those segments of life that we're feeling out of whack with. We'll say, if you feel out of balance with something, then step back from it and go, what, where, where is that bucket empty? Where do you maybe need to add to another bucket in order to make this one feel whole? What's your thoughts? Yeah, I was going to go in a different direction. And I appreciate you saying that because when we start to judge ourselves for what we're not doing or not good at or hating receipts or not being good at yard work or whatever it is, then we start to really beat ourselves up. And that's where I think the values conversation come in. I know for people that just love to have fun. That's all they want to do, whether it's artistic or sports, or they just want to play, 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 bike ride, play, 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 play. I think that's amazing. And I think what's really cool about that is there is opportunities when you identify what you love to do, you can find a way to make a living at it. I loved skating, loved it, loved it, loved it, but I wasn't good enough as a competitor, but I wanted to do something that I loved. And I love being on the ice and I love being around people and I love coaching. So I knew that, but could I make a living at it? And I was really fortunate and really blessed that I asked myself that question. So I invite anyone that's listening is to ask yourself the question, all the things that you're doing on your to-do list or your I will list, what I, is what I call it, is all the things that are on there, are they things that you can do that you at least like to do, maybe not love to do yet? Are there things that you can delegate? Are there things that you can actually maybe take off your list that don't matter? It's a should. I should do this because if I don't, I'm going to be judged or somebody's going to look at me like I'm disorganized. Like whatever the stories that you have in your head, take a look at your values. If you really enjoy something and you're, you're fully present to it and you're fully present with the sport or with your kids or hanging out, painting, whatever it is, bring yourself there. Because that, those are moments in time that actually will also fill your bucket in whatever bucket that needs to be filled in those moments by being present to whatever it is, whether you like it or not, be present to what you're doing and see what shows up from there. Fantastic. And before we sign off, I just want to say go to the everydaymillion.ca webpage. And I also do a blog. I'm doing a blog once a week. I don't know how long I'll make it last. But right now, that's what I'm choosing to do. It's a good bucket for me to fill called writing because I like to do it. And Stephanie, I think we uh, we busted balance. Busted, balance. busted the balance myth. There you go. So thanks for joining me on the Everyday Millionaire Mindset Matters. Thanks. That was fun. Mm -hmm.